Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Dalton. I'm the executive director of the Adams County Historical Society here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We are excited to be bringing you this video from the roof of a very historic structure right in downtown Gettysburg. We're on the roof of the Faunastock House. It was a major center for activity during the battle and after when it was taken over by the United States Sanitary Commission. Um, during the battle, obviously it was used as a hospital and uh, there's tons of incredible accounts left by civilians of the battle who lived just uh, yards from here. We're going to talk about that as well as the retreat through Gettysburg. Uh, the Union Army pushed back off of McPherson's Ridge and Oak Ridge and north of town, uh, fall back through the town of Gettysburg on the afternoon into the late evening of July 1st, 1863. During that retreat, uh, bullets fly through the town, uh, hitting brick buildings, fences, uh, wounding soldiers as they're pushing back through town towards the fallback position for the Union Army on East Cemetery Hill. Some of those bullets hit this sign that I'm holding right here. Uh, it was the sign for the tailor shop of William T. King, uh, a local resident who was actually serving in the Union Army at the time. Uh, many of the residents returned to find damage just like this that had been done uh, to their houses, their shops, uh, their barns. Um, and everything else you could imagine. So let me bring in uh, Tim Smith, historian and collections manager of the Adams County Historical Society, to talk about uh, the Faunastock House uh, broadly and then also the retreat through town and, and why we haven't really paid a lot of attention as scholars um, and as authors and, and uh, enthusiasts to the, the role that the town of Gettysburg played um, in the battle. So why don't you come on, Tim? So obviously the town was here at the time of the battle people lived in it and it was fighting the streets of town but it's not discussed as much as perhaps it could be in many histories of the fighting and there are a bunch of reasons for that first of all the town is not part of the national park so when you think of the gettysburg national military park and you come here and there's interpretation of the battlefield the town is not necessarily part of the interpretation it makes sense that the interpretation would be on the heavy fighting that took place in the fields north and west and south of the town itself. Secondly, the town has never really uh, pushed its history as part of the fighting. There's always been sort of a delineation between the historic battlefield and the town. And of course, some people fear that highlighting the history of the town itself might lead to people wanting to preserve the town or keep the town as it is and it would kind of ruin some of the economic opportunities in the town. The third reason it's not really mentioned in a lot of histories of the battle early on is because the South won the first day of the battle. And with a lot of Northern writers, the least said about the fighting in the streets and the retreat through the town, the better. As a matter of fact, books make it appear as if the Northern Army's first day's fighting was a delaying action and they were only fighting to hold the Southerners back long enough so they could all fall back to the predetermined position on Cemetery Hill. So the retreat through the town was sort of a change of position instead of men running through the streets. And of course, um, uh, the last reason you don't hear much about it is because it's difficult to describe. The fighting in the streets is confusing, confusing and chaotic. And the people who were involved in it only knew what they saw from a limited perspective and were trying to get through the town as quick as possible. Uh, there's also a few reasons why the retreat through the town was as chaotic as it is. And one of them is because the troops west of the town, the 1st Army Corps, actually marched up the Emmitsburg Road and passed south and west of the town and took position in the area where the first day's battle was fought. So when the time came to retreat through the town, those soldiers had not been in the town, had no idea where Cemetery Hill was located or even how to get back to it. Number two, the Union officers did not um, establish a retreat system through the town. General Howard believed that if he had sent out information about where Cemetery Hill was or what route the units would take to get back, that they would retreat quicker and he wanted to hold out as long as possible. So when the Northern Army entered the town from the west, they had no idea which way to go to get to Cemetery Hill. And of course, as the Northern Army retreated into town from the west, the northern troops north of the town were coming into the town from the north and 
the 1st and 11th Corps collided in the center of the town during the retreat back to Cemetery Hill. And of course, the Southern Army uh, captured a large amount of men during the retreat at the edge of the town and in the streets of the town itself. Just try to imagine, maybe I'm overstating it slightly, but we're talking about 20,000 Northern soldiers retreating through the town, 30,000 Southerners closing in on the town, 2,000 people hiding in their cellars, and all the roads lead to one spot in the center of the town. It was complete and utter chaos. And these soldiers didn't really know where they were going, right, Tim? So they're, they're going down streets, alleys, into houses. Um, in some cases, they can't get out. They realize they're trapped and they hide. Do you have any accounts that you really like about the uh, Union soldiers uh, going through houses and, and coming out in people's backyards? Well, the night of the first day, the Southern Army established squads of soldiers and made a concerted effort to go through the individual houses and look for soldiers who were hiding in the houses. And we have a bunch of accounts of this. My favorite story occurred right here, a short distance away on Middle Street, where a squad of Confederate soldiers came into the house and one of the soldiers they had previously captured broke away and ran upstairs. And they weren't really worried about it because there was no place for him to go. Well, the lady of the house, her husband had just died a few weeks earlier. She went upstairs, gave him her husband's clothes, gave him a razor, he shaved real quick, came walking downstairs in civilian clothes and said, hey, someone just jumped out the window up there. And he escaped capture by that ruse. And that was um, the um, McClellan house, just a uh, short distance from the courthouse. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so we are live again on the roof of the Fauna Stock House in downtown Gettysburg. Um, I'm Andrew Dalton from the Adams County Historical Society. Right behind me is the famous square of Gettysburg uh, called the Diamond at the time of the battle. Um, and we are just a block off of the square at the intersection of Middle Street and Baltimore Street. Now I want to bring on our good friend John Hoptak, Ranger from the National Park Service. Should point out this program is part of a partnership uh, we're very excited about uh, for anniversary events uh, related to the 157th battle anniversary of Gettysburg. John is a little afraid of heights, so bear with him. Uh, but John is going to give us a great summary of what actually happened on this roof on the afternoon of July 1st, 1863. Sure. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, everybody. A uh, very significant date. 157 years ago, this battle uh, turned the town of Gettysburg upside down. Uh, so standing on top of the Fonestock building, uh, we do get an incredible view. And you are looking north behind me, by the way, past the town roundabout or diamond, uh, north along Carlisle Street. And if you had this vantage point, just about 4 p.m. on the afternoon of Wednesday, July 1st of 1863, as Tim mentioned, you would have seen just thousands upon thousands of soldiers in blue. They are soaked in sweat, covered in dirt, in grime of a hard day's fight, making their way back toward us around the square, uh, heading south uh, behind the, your point of view towards Cemetery Hill uh, in the distance. Union soldiers of the First Corps making their way in largely from the west and these two sides colliding. Uh, a number of Union officers would later try to downplay some of the chaos, some of the confusion that was happening in town. Charles Wainwright of the First Corps, the artillery commander, would later deny that there was much in the way of chaos. He tried to describe it as orderly, an orderly retreat. He tried to describe officers on the corners directing the First Corps that way, the 11th Corps this way and such. But I want to go back. A few hours before the retreat actually began, somewhere between maybe 10.30 and 11 o'clock that morning, and again, timing is always tr tricky when we study the Civil War, but some point late that morning, Union 11th Corps Commander Oliver Otis Howard made his way into the town of Gettysburg, and he was hoping to find a location from which he could get a good view of the unfolding battle that was occurring to the west. He thought perhaps he could get on top of the courthouse, which is directly across the street from us, uh, but he determined a better view perhaps could be had from an observatory on this very rooftop. So Oliver Howard is very young, 33 years old. His right arm had been shattered by a mini ball one year before, and uh, it had been amputated. Yet somehow he was able to make his way to the top, looking out to the west, as the fields west of town are getting covered in smoke. He may have noticed that there were other residents of Gettysburg on other rooftops. Also, overcome by curiosity, 
uh, trying to get a view of the battle that was unfolding. And as Oliver Howard was watching the fight unfolding to the west, he heard a voice from the street below him. Howard! Howard, are you up there? Howard! He made his way to the edge of the roof. He looked over and there was a Union officer on horseback shouting up to him that John Reynolds, commanding the First Corps, had been killed. And because Oliver Howard was the next ranking officer here, he was now in charge of the escalating battle. Well, Oliver Howard, just like John Buford, just like John Reynolds, noticed the importance of the hilltop south of town. And after he was notified that he was now in command of whatever was happening out there, he made his way back to Cemetery Hill. He turned to one of his staff officers and said, this seems to be a good position. General, this is the only position. So Oliver Howard would then get his 11th Corps making their way north trying to connect up with the First Corps, of course, but they were unable to do so. And that afternoon, after the Union lines collapsed, as the Confederate avalanche came in from the west and from the north, these men of the 1st and 11th Corps somehow tried to make their way through this labyrinth. Keep in mind, now many of you, I am sure, have been to Gettysburg many, many, many times. But I'm willing to bet there weren't many soldiers here that day who had ever been to this town before. And we know the roads. Still to this day, I get turned around, even after working here, going down this way and that way. So imagine how confusing it was to a, to a 19 year old kid from Maine or, or a, a 17 year old kid from Wisconsin, if he was with the 11th Corps, making their way through this unknown town, blind alleyways, hopping over fences, trampling vegetable gardens, and as Tim mentioned, a number of them seeking safe haven in private homes and residences. Uh, so if we were on this rooftop 157 years ago right now, we would have been, we would have been privileged to quite a scene unfolding beneath us. That's right. Thanks, John. That's great. And, you know, John makes a great point about this chaotic retreat. Of course, there's people of all ages um, watching the battle from upper windows in their homes, um, as well as from the rooftops just like this. And there were obser observatories on several prominent buildings around town where you could have seen uh, spectators uh, during the entire course of the fighting on July 1st. Again, I'm holding one of those artifacts that can actually be tied to this Union retreat through town as the Confederates pushed through Gettysburg. Uh, signs like this were riddled with bullets. Um, this is a severe combat, uh, se this is severe combat all through the town. Um, and you have, you know, factions of, of different units, companies, and, and uh, small squads of men fighting against small squads of the attacking Confederates. Um, and like Tim and I have talked about already, uh, the battle would, in, in some cases, uh, move through people's homes, uh, through their yards, um, and the people of Gettysburg were left with an incredible uh, ordeal uh, in terms of wounded soldiers uh, that were left in, in just about every structure in the town. Uh, so thanks again for, for joining us here on the roof of the Fonestock House in Gettysburg. Again, we are just a block from the famous square in town. I hope you can see it in the background. And I want to thank John Hoptak of the National Park Service, Tim Smith of the Adams County Historical Society, and all the, the folks watching uh, for being with us today.